kernels and hardware. When you're running a Linux system, you might have questions about a kernel. Well, first of all, what is a kernel? Well, the kernel is the main program that runs your operating system. It's the main thing. So Linux is the kernel. So which kernel version am I running? Well, there's lots of different kernels. Which am I running? And where is the kernel file stored? Where is the source code for the kernel? And what options were used when building the kernel? So let's take a look at these questions and see if we can figure them out. So here we have a system. I'm running my Linux system and I want to know which kernel I'm running. Well, if you look in your etc directory, there's a bunch of files in there. So if we cat out our etc, there's a Red Hat release file. And that tells me which version of CentOS I'm running. But it doesn't tell me which kernel I'm using. So that's kind of uh, tough. So you start saying, well, where else could it be stored? It actually turns out there's an easy way to do it. We just have in the uname command, uname minus r. And that tells me my kernel. So my kernel is 310-957.12.1.el7.x86-64. So these el7 maps up to this CentOS release thing, which is 7. Same 7 right there. Now the 7.6, well, that is kind of retied to the Red Hat release, and this 18.10 basically tells you which uh, CentOS release this is. All right, so we've got that. How was the kernel built? Well, most things on a Linux system are built with the GCC compiler. But do we know if it was both well that? Well, we can actually take a look at the kernel, and the kernel can tell you something as well. So we cat proc version, and we see, once again, that same exact number. So this number right here, the kernel number is showing up right here. So that's the kernel. <clears throat> you can see where it was built and the GCC version that was used to build it. All right, so that's good information. So where is the kernel file? I mean, it's built, it's loaded in memory, I get that. Where is it at? Well, fortunately, you can find it in the boot directory. And some systems have boot mounted by default, some don't. You can always cut out the etc fs tab file and see what it says about your boot directory. Um, it's got my device here, so UUID, and then this boot, and it says XFS defaults. So it's not, not being not booted. Sometimes it doesn't actually load for some older uh, Linux versions because they don't plan on changing the kernel off often and so they just don't load it and it also protects it a little bit but it is mounted and it should be there so I go over to the boot directory and take a look there are a bunch of files here and if I go back to my uname command once again I can see this is the number I'm looking for so if I do ls minus do l and then pipe that through a grep and we want to do a back tick u name minus r and what we're going to do is we're going to look at all of the files and we're going to filter out just the ones that happen to have that string in them grep u name minus r u name minus r in there all right so you can see there's a bunch of stuff here okay what is it well this first one on the top is your config that is the configuration options that were used when creating this kernel. So as you might expect, you less out that config with 12, and you'll see a bunch of options, tons of options with yeses and, and modules and not set and things like that. And you go through and say, okay, so that's how the kernel was built. All these options are set. And there's lots of options. You just kind of keep scrolling through them. Lots of options to set. All right. Then you have this RAM disk thing. RAM, init RAM FS. Well, it's the initial RAM disk file system thing, and that's kind of important. What does it have? Well, 
when your kernel gets loaded to memory, the way it happens is you have your, I guess your BIOS loads the first part of your hard drive. And the first part of your hard drive loads your, your bootloader. And your bootloader looks at your configuration files, figures out what to load, and then it loads your kernel. And when it loads your kernel, there's always that risk. There's a slight risk that your kernel will load up and it will not have the drivers in order to read the file system. So that could be um, because you have some kind of a RAID set up, hardware RAID, you need to have the hardware RAID drivers in there, otherwise you can't read the RAID, and if you can't read the RAID, you can't get anything from the hard drive. It could be all kinds of problems. But the BIOS, when it's reading, it reads things differently than the kernel reads them. So it has the ability to read things that the kernel cannot read. So that could be a little interesting. So it's always possible to get in a situation where your kernel is loaded, but your kernel cannot read the hardware because it needs some kind of drivers. So where do you put those drivers? Well, you can put those drivers in the initial RAM disk. And so you put drivers in there, these little kernel modules, and they get loaded, and then it can suddenly read the rest of the system. So that could be important. Let's get down to the bottom. We got this VM Linux thing. So the Z is for compression. It's basically a compressed file. It's really a larger file. And that is your kernel. That's your kernel built out, compressed, waiting to be loaded into memory. So that's what happens. That gets loaded. But then where is the source code? Well, source code for the kernel is usually stored in the USR src directory so let's take a look over here we've got oh, this directory called kernels so let's go in here and take a look at our kernels kernels take a look and it's empty why is it empty well if you think about it most people don't need their source code for their kernel right you just want the kernel to run you don't need the plans you just want it there so some versions of Linux ship without the kernel. Well, that can be a bit of a problem because what happens if you need the kernel? Well, that's okay. We can get pieces of the kernel. So when do you need the kernel? If you are changing some of your libraries and your libraries need to be able to access the kernel, so you need to make uh, system calls to grab stuff from the kernel, you might need to have your kernel headers. And the kernel headers can be loaded with a special package. So let's look. If I do a yum install kernel devel, it will install the kernel headers. So I do yes. Now, contrary to common belief, if you install this kernel devel, it doesn't give you everything you need to develop the kernel. No, not quite. Not that at all. In fact, all you're really getting is the kernel headers. Quite a small little uh, piece of information. You need more in order to actually build the kernel. But we can go in there and take a look. So now we suddenly see there is a directory here. So I go to that directory. And I can see all kinds of files here. And one of the files is that config thing. So catmy.config. And I can see this looks like, well, a bunch of the same thing that we had in that boot directory. If I do a diff to compare my dot config in this directory, config, to the one in boot dot uh, config, right here, you'll find those two files are exactly the same. So there's no differences. So that's great. That's kind of nice. But what if I don't want this kernel? What if I want to get a new kernel? Well, you can download it, or what if I want to actually build a kernel? Well, you can do that too. In fact, you can look at your options even. There is a menu config thing. You can do a make menu config and look at your options, but it doesn't quite work without some development tools and a little bit more. So let's do a yum group install, and we're going to get our development tools. That's the entire development tools package set which includes your GCC compiler and all kinds of other libraries.
So this will get you most of what you need in order to be able to see what the kernel needs in order to be developed and so that. So after a couple of seconds, it's all downloaded and you're ready to go. And I want to do a yum install n curses. n curses allows me to have menus. So I can do up, down, navigation through menus with the keypad. All right, so I do a make menu config. So I want to make sure I'm in this directory, which I'm in. You can see I'm in the correct directory. You can see there is this make file here, which allows me to run the make command. So I do a make menu config, and that will do this right here, print a few things, and suddenly it'll pop into a nice GUI right here. And I can go look at the options that were set at the time that this kernel was built. You can go into individual things, say, okay, do I have the second extended file system that's ext2? Do I have it? No, I don't have it. Do I have ext3? No, I don't really have it. But I do have ext4, that's great. And ext4 can read ext2 and ext3. We just want to make sure we use that. And so you can say, well, what if I want something like ReaserFS? or JFS or XFS, I can put those in there. I can even build it into the kernel if I want to not use modules. But you probably want to just use this as a module because maybe you're not using F XFS. But if you know you are, maybe you build it in. All right, so exit out. And if you make changes, you can save those changes and that's good for building your kernel. Usually what you do to make your kernel is you use the make command and you do a well make make all um, but that doesn't really work here because we don't have the source code so where do we get the source code well the source code actually can be found in other places such as right here in kernel.org you can see kernel.org you can see the Linux kernel archives it has a bunch of files here you just download one of these tarballs and decompress it in the uh, USR SRC kernels directory. And then from in there, you can just go inside of it and build it. You can make sure you have your development tools, make sure you have end curses, make sure if anything else is missing. And yeah, then you're good to go. All right, but that doesn't really get it all taken care of. So, Let's go back and see what drivers do we actually need, right? Because you think about it, you've got this, this thing. We, we know where the kernel, what version you're running, you know where it's stored. You know the source code's not there, but you can get the development um, headers if you want, which can be used for building other stuff. And you know what options were built or used when building it. So how do I know what hardware I need to use? So you need to know what hardware you have on your system. And you can figure out which USB devices you have. You can see which PCI devices you have. Um, you can see which drivers were used or are being used. And you can see specific versions of all kinds of stuff. And this information is going to be useful. So let's take a look at it. So if I do LS USB, it says, these are the devices that are connected to me. Okay. Well, these are the kinds of things I got which is kind of nice, doesn't really tell me much because um, there's nothing really there. I can also do LS PCI and that says these are the PCI devices that I have on my system. Well, what if that's not enough information? What if you need to know more information than just that? Because I can see, okay, I've got a VGA compatible controller thing here. That's nice. So I know that's what I need for my graphics card. And I can also use my Ethernet controller right here, but I don't know what drivers I'm using. So you can do a LSPCI minus V for verbose. And that says, oh, here's some information. And you can see, for example, my video card right here. Got some information about it. That's nice. Um, drop down to my Ethernet controller right here. And it even tells me things like this is the driver 
This is the kernel module that's being used. The E1000 is being used. Some of them tell me the drivers such as the sound cards and PCI things, all these things are showing up and giving me information. But what if that's not enough information? What if I want more? I just add another V. Suddenly we have more. What if that's not enough? I want more. I just add another V. Okay, so it doesn't give me that much more. So really two V's is about as much as you get, but you can use three. So add a couple of V's and you're good. You can see what hardware you have with this PCI thing. So why is that important? Well, you need to know which drivers you're using if you want to guarantee you have them when you do your installation or building of a new kernel. It can be kind of important. You want to make sure that they're either built or make sure that they are built into the kernel so that you don't need to build the modules. Kernel modules. So what are kernel modules? Well, kernel modules are your drivers. They're the little pieces of kernel code that gets loaded in and used. So you might say, well, why would I build kernel modules for hardware I never need or don't use? Well, I don't know. Why would you? Well, you might use it. But if you know you will never use something, you don't need that module. It's, it's not necessary. So then, why were the kernel modules built outside of the kernel instead of in the kernel? Well, the reason they're built outside of it is because you don't necessarily need everything. And there are even problems where multiple different kernel modules can conflict with each other. And you can't have two, two of the similar modules because maybe one will work and the other won't. There might be two different modules built for the same hardware and you only want one of them, maybe one's open source and one's a proprietary closed source, and that could be, well, a good reason to have them outside the kernel because you can only have one in the kernel. And if it's in the kernel, it's guaranteed to be in the memory. And what if you don't ever use XFS or EXT2 or 3? If you don't use EXT2 or 3, why would you want that, that kernel module built into your kernel? Just don't build it. So which kernel modules are loaded? Well, you can use the ls mod command to see uh, which ones are being loaded and things like that. So let's go take a look at that right now. So clear this up. I do ls mod. And suddenly it shoots as a big list. So we knew we were using the E1000 driver for our, our uh, network card. And we can see right there it's being used. The E1000 is loaded up and it's in, in there. But you can see lots of other drivers in there as well. So which drivers do we have? Well, you can do mod probe and that kind of tells me something. It says, well, here's some things you can do. And it's just saying, well, what, what do I have? And you've got this minus A option. So let's figure out what that does. So we do mod probe minus a, and nothing there. We want to usually you can use mod probe to load drivers, and sometimes you can use it to list the drivers as well. Um, this up. So let's approach this a different way. So we, Mod Pro apparently doesn't have the option anymore to look at all the modules, but we can still load modules. And let's take a look at the directories where they are stored. So if I look at the lib directory, ls, let's say lib, there is a lib modules modules all right so that's interesting there's a lib modules and then we want to get our kernel which is three and there was a 12 and we can see this stuff right here well that's a, a lot of modules right maybe so we use the find command find and we can list out a bunch of things in here well, we know that we want to look for the, let's find their network driver. 
So we know it's E1000. So I do rep, rep E1000. And we can see suddenly this is where you can find the drivers for the E1000. There's the E1000 and there's the E1000 um, E, whatever that is. But you can see um, the directory where it's stored, and you can also see the actual module stored there. And it, most of them end in a KO, but these ones are apparently compressed, so they have an XZ at the end. And so these all get loaded at boot time. And well, maybe when it gets loaded. And sometimes they get loaded at other times. So once again, if you look at LS mod, you can see the list of modules. If I want to remove a module, I can do that as well with an RM mod or INS mod for insert mod. And mod probe, once again, can add or remove modules. So those are a couple things with kernel modules. So we can see, first of all, um, which kernel modules are loaded with the ls mod command. We can see um, which kernel modules there are by just doing a look at the uh, the lib modules directory and then how do I load kernel modules you can do mod probe to load them or ins mod so why would I want to build my own kernel well sometimes you want to build a kernel for a specific purpose maybe you don't want to have any extra modules built in maybe you want to just build a kernel that specifically meets a set of hardware and you're done if you do an embedded system you want to make sure your hardware meets exactly or matches exactly what the kernel has are there any performance advantages to building a kernel yes there are you can build a kernel specifically for your hardware and then you can optimize everything is that a lot of work yes it's a lot of work how do I build a kernel well first you need to get the source code and we saw where to get that because you get it from kernel.org you download that you put it into your user SRC kernels directory decompress the file you go into that file and you then can um, make sure you have your libraries installed and you can do a make menu config and set your settings um, if you want to copy over a config you can copy over a config from a previous or different version of the kernel that you know works and then change the settings up a bit then you do a make make all and it will build it why do I need a compiler well you need a compiler because you need something to convert your source code into machine code how long does it take to build a kernel and the modules well that's an interesting question it depends on what your CPU is if your CPU is a nice slow virtual machine CPU it could take you I don't know, two to three hours to build your kernel if you were building on much harder faster um, multi-core CPUs you can do it much faster uh, you can do it in 10 to 10 to 20 minutes so why does it take so long well there are a lot of files there's millions of lines of code in that kernel so you are looking at a lot of stuff parsing a lot of stuff and it depends on how many options you build the more options you put in there the longer it takes once a kernel has been built how do i change which kernel i'm using well remember the bootloader loads the kernel right so all you need to do is tell the bootloader how to load your kernel all right that sounds pretty easy so how do i change the default kernel in the system he's using well, with the bootloader and let's go take a look at that so clear this out the bootloader so let's drop back to that boot directory again in here there is a grub and a grub2 so let's take a look at the two directories so if we do ls minus l grub grub i can see a splash.xpm.g Z. That is the splash screen you see when you boot up your system if you're using Grub. So it's being loaded. Great. That's not where you make changes. If you go into Grub 2, this is also not where you make your changes, but you can see what changes have been made. There's a Grub.c 
.cfg file here. So let's take a look at that one. grub.cfg. And it's got all this information here. But what's useful is it tells you basically where the files come from. So it's a collection of files from the etc grub.d directory. So it goes through and it reads in these files. So it takes this first one, 00 underscore header, and then it puts the header in there. And then you can see it's adding each piece one at a time. All right. Well, if you go down here, you see there's this 10 Linux, and you can see there's an option here, menu entry, uh, menu entry. So whatever here is in this menu entry quote is what you will see when you're booting up. That will be the option you can choose to boot. And then it tells you things like which modules have you loaded. And it then has this line right here, Linux 16, where it tells you this is where you load the Linux kernel. Then right after you load the Linux kernel, you load the initial RAM disk. So it loads that image right there. So those two get loaded and then you're good to go. So how do I know what it's using? Well, it says a couple of things that are interesting here. Um, there's a timeout that says you got five seconds to actually choose which kernel you want to load. Um, and yeah, you can also figure out which kernel is being loaded because you've got this uh, default value things like that. Okay, so what do we do? We just need to go in there and change what the default is, right? Or you can add another line in there. So you go to the etc grub.d directory and in here you can see all these files that are then thrown together to generate your kernel. If you look at the readme file, let's readme, you can see information about these. Well, okay, so these are how it does it. So you've got these zero, zero things for reserve for the header. You got this 10 stuff for your native boot entries. And then you got this 20 stuff for your third party app stuff so that they can all jump together and build it up. <clears throat> and it builds this when you run a script or program to do that. So now let's look at how we can actually generate this. You can generate these things and you gotta be sort of being careful when you get to some of this stuff because if you mess things up too badly, it can be bad. Um, but there is a grub2 to, grub to command. So you can see there's a bunch of commands here, but grub2 make config and that one will generate your configuration file. So you'd want to do a minus O and tell it your file. So you do like a boot grub2 and if I want to do a grub.cfg file I can do that. Let's just do a new so I can compare. So I run that command right here. It grabs all the stuff. That's good. So if I go over to my uh, etc, actually not my boot grub2 directory, I can see I've got a grub dot cfg and a grub dot cfg dot new and if I do a diff on the two of them grub cfg and grub dot cfg dot new I can see there are a bunch of differences what are they well things like you know this one different versions of the kernel so it's just changed the menu options it looks like I basically just got a new kernel and um, I haven't installed it yet. Um, but that's about it. Right there is just slightly newer kernel. All right. Um, and also it changed the default things like that. So you can mess with your grub configuration there. Um, you can also do things like set a password. There's a grub to make password thing and you could run that and type in some password like aloha123 aloha123 and it will say your password you just need to copy that piece and install it into your 
um, your grub configuration files if you wanted to add something. Um, but yeah, you can you can mess with your bootloader and change it. And that's how you can work on installing your new kernel and making things work. Mess with grub. So your etc grub.d directory, and then you can just build your your grub configuration file at boot time. Anyway, that gives you an idea of what grub is. So is it important to be able to change your kernel? Yeah, sometimes, but it's done automatically whenever you install new kernels. It automatically rebuilds everything for you. Anyway, that is it for your kernels and hardware.